Um, I'd like to welcome our next uh, guest speaker on the theme of people in stress, and that's uh, Dr. Narina uh, Ramlakan. Uh, Narina is the author of Tired Not Wired, and she's going to talk about how the rapid growth of digital has brought huge advantages, but also huge disconnects. So, stage is yours. Thank you. I'm, I'm called a sleep and energy expert. And I help people to sleep. I help people to have more energy. What are the energy levels like at the moment? It's, I'm just aware. It's, it's that time of the day where if I use the word sleep too many times, I, I'm in, in danger of losing you. Um, and my book, by the way, is called Tired But Wired. So, I mean, did you sleep last night? Did you get to sleep? Now, I see so many people. That's not me, by the way. Um, I see so many people who they, they get into bed they're exhausted, and it's as if they've got a mad monkey in their brain. Uh, that just won't stop. Did, did anyone get that last night? You're exhausted, that you've got fragments of the day, snippets of the day intruding into your sleep, and so you wake up in the morning feeling as if you haven't slept at all. A kind of paradoxical insomnia, because if you go to a sleep laboratory, they would measure that you have in fact slept, and probably slept seven or eight hours, but it doesn't feel as if you've slept at all. So something crazy has been going on in your head. So that, that's just a little bit of an introduction into what I've been doing for the last 25 years, and I'm just aware that I need one of these, don't I? Um, so I have spent, gosh, showing my age, the last 20 plus years looking at the impact of technology. So I used to be an academic. I'm not a medical doctor. I'm a neurophysiologist. Studied neurophysiology. Um, many, many years ago at King's College in the Strand, and um, probably because of my own sleep problems, I studied sleep and, and the brain. And then I left the academic world and headed into the city after a number of different failed job attempts, ended up in a, in a, clinic, in a clinic in Moorgate called City Healthcare, um, a health screening clinic where what I was doing was measuring the health of city professionals, so measuring, um, doing executive medicals for people like you know, Goldman Sachs, Merrill's, so the big professional services firms. And when I started working at the clinic, I had come from a laboratory, you know, where as an academic, there were six of us scientists, and we shared two phones. Um, in fact, no, we had one phone, we had two computers, we had a fax machine, and if the phone went, we all thought we were really stressed, and you, of course we'd retire to the bar at five o'clock in the afternoon to talk about our stress levels. And then, of course, I came to the city, and this is when the internet and email, of course, um, exploded onto the scene. And I, down in my little basement clinic, I would measure the impact of technology on the health and the physiology of my clients. Does that make sense? So I was looking directly at the impact of technology on, uh, and speed, if you like, on <coughs> physiological variable, variables, blood pressure, cholesterol, energy levels, sleep patterns, the ECG trace, um, even we called it truncal thickening in those days, but you, you know what I mean, okay? So even you know how fast people were going was impacting on, on how much weight they put on. So I don't work there anymore, but what I now do is I spend a lot of time in corporate environments, law firms, investment banks, lots of those, every Tuesday. So that was yesterday, I work at a psychiatric clinic in Marlebone, where I see the effects of burnout. So I work with anxiety, depression, sleep problems, that sort of thing. And the reason I'm telling you about that is because I go into all these different types of environments, and I can measure the, the effect of life on people's health. And I'm nosy, and I'm curious, and so it fascinates me slightly worries me as well, and so I'm kind of on a mission to just look at how we can seek some balance in all of this, given that every physiological process in the body runs on a process of oscillation, it oscillates, and we need to find a balance point somewhere in there, and I think we're kind of getting a little bit out of balance, but it's not all doom and gloom. So, um, I've been observing technology, the data, people love data. I mean, I'm a pseudoscientist, I'm not an academic anymore, but data, um, direct line uh, last week, or the week before, I think it was, they came up with some statistics. Technology is the one thing we can't live without. Apparently, we would rather um, do without hot water and, and showers and food than, than go without our Wi-Fi connection, uh, up, to us, up to a point. Um, but it was some soft science. I don't know how long we could do without it, because surely we'd all want to shower at some point. 
something. Anyway, um, the average person checks their phone 140 times a day. But then I found recently that, that teenagers, um, apparently it's, it's double, it's double this, more than double, about 300 times a day. And I don't know if any of you have young children. My, I have a 10-year-old daughter who's glorious because I can control her at the moment. Um, but any of you have teenagers where that pushing back is getting a little bit difficult? Any of you in that, in that situation? where it's difficult to wrestle, the, 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 um, I'm, you know, at my clinic we have, we set up a few years ago the first technology addiction, adolescent technology addiction centre. Um, and 80%, what did you do? What was your, what was the first thing you did this morning? When you, um, mm -mm, I don't want to hear anything too personal, but you know, what was the first thing you did? <laughs> did you reach over and check your phone? And this is what most of us do these days. And I have to say, my inclination is to do exactly that because I have clients across time zones and I want to know what's happened overnight because things happen overnight now. And I want to know what's <coughs> come in. I run my own business. I want to know what's come in. And um, so we want to check. And, and so whereas, um, you know, decades, a couple of decades ago, people might have prayed or reached over to their other half and had a little cuddle or something, now we recheck our phones, you know, we reach over and these devices are so seductive. Um, so th this, is, this is what's happening. Now, I recently went into a local um, uh, secondary school where I live in Surrey, in Kingston, and um, I, I did a survey, I did some work with them on sleep because they asked me to go in because so many children were exhausted and it, I have to say, this piece of work I did in um, June before they broke up, the most depressing piece of work that I did, because so many of these children were exhausted, years 8 to 10, and, um, and the number of them who were retired, and, and a few of them had their energy drinks in, in the room as well. So this is years 8 to 10, not 8 to 10 year olds. And so we're looking at 13 to 15 year olds. Um, over 75% of them had mobile phones. 60% um, of them, there's no curfew, they sleep with their phones in the bedroom, and over 45%, almost half of them, have got sleep problems. So I'm going back again to do some, some more work with them. But I think the reality is, is that for a lot of people, for a lot of us, a lot of us, there's, there's a bit of overwhelm going on. I mean, technology is wonderful, so I'm not saying it's all bad. And I love the fact that this morning, before I came here, I could sit just after the school run, dash back to my office at home, and do a webinar and, and connect with my, with my clients and, um, and, and run a session for them. And that was fantastic. And then go for zip out for a run along the river quickly after that and then get ready and come here. And the fact that technology makes that possible, for me, I think is absolutely wonderful. But I think we, we need to start becoming a little bit more aware of the physiology behind what's going on up here. And in a way, I mean, we are amazing. I think we are amazing. And I think our brains are amazing. And, and the more I study physiology, the more I learn about it, the more I, I buy into this belief. But I think we do have the fact that we're working with some limitations. So if we just take a little sidestep and, and look at a bit of physiology behind this, um, and how the brain is adapted uh, to deal with information, then you can see why we can find ourselves running into problems. So there's a part of the brain which is called the, uh, the working memory, tiny, tiny part of the brain that's only fairly recently, if you look at the history of human beings and our evolution, has only fairly recently um, evolved. So um, actually this looks very complicated and I'm not going to go into all of this, but the, what the working memory does essentially is it acts as the short-term reservoir for all the other bits of the brain. So information, if you're listening to me at the moment and you're not in what is technically <coughs> called a hypnagogic trance, you're not asleep on me, and you look pretty engaged. Um, so if you're listening to me, that information's going in. It's going into your working memory. It sits in your working memory, and your working memory then decides at some point what it's going to do with that information. Was that interesting? I store it in my memory, or I, I, I throw it away. The problem is working memory is tiny. Um, if you look at how the brain evolved, history of evolution of the brain, develop, brain development, let's just say that's the spinal cord. You have a brain stem. We have a primitive brain fight or flight, survival, reproduction, fighting threat, all of those things in our primitive brain. And then more recently, what curled over that is the frontal lobe. 
And if I were to put a tiny dot in that, I wouldn't be able to sleep. It'd be so tiny. That is our working memory. So in functional terms, it's tiny, tiny, tiny. And it operates on a cycle roughly of about 60 to 90 minutes. What does that mean? It means that every 60 to 90 minutes we need to go gormless. We go gormless. We go stupid. You know, we need to go offline in an attempt to pack this information away, to consolidate. It's a vital part of memory consolidation, being intelligent, learning. It's so important for children. So that my daughter is now 10 years old. Her working memory is starting to become uh, the, the cycle capacity about 60 to 90 minutes. But for younger children, it's about 20, 30 minutes. Footballers as well, I think. So. <laughs> um, I, I do work with premiership footballers, so I can say that. But anyway, no, I'm not being serious. But, but anyway, it's, it's very limiting. So our working memory operates in cycles like that. And if you think about your subjective experience of that, you know, you sit in a meeting and all of a sudden you glaze over. And all of a sudden, you know, someone's looking at you. They, they've asked you a question and then you have no idea what's been said because you've been on planet La La Land or something. And, and that actually, technically, you are more intelligent. You're more intelligent when that happens because your brain is passing information out. So I don't know if you can use that in defense when you're next to <laughs> sleeping in a meeting. I don't know. But, um, in fact, my last blog was called Why We Need to Be More Gormless. Because when we are gormless, we become creative. We, when we go gormless, we move down in our consciousness and we get to a hit point when we hit the theta state where we become creative, we become innovative, free flow of ideas and thoughts, we pack away information. So we need to oscillate. We want to be on top of our game. We cannot run our lives with relentless linearity. And this is where I see people ending up at my clinic and children going, but you see, the more linear we work, the more we risk um, flipping our lid. <coughs> we flip the lid and we become unintelligent. Does that make sense? So, um, I don't think technology, five minutes, how does that happen? Technology is not the enemy. No, we need to look at that again. Technology is not the enemy. The fact that I can Skype my 80-year-old mother in South America, she's just got the hang of it. And it's brilliant. And it feels like we're in the same room and she no, no longer sits in front of it like a headless chicken. I mean, I'm frozen, but you know, we, we can engage, we can connect, we can communicate. That my late father saw his granddaughter several times before he, he died. It was fantastic. You know, he, technology makes this possible. I had my first technology addicted granny at my clinic a few weeks ago. She's brilliant, but her very wise GP sent her to me because she's on three types of sleeping tablet because she can't sleep. Why? Because she's Instagramming, Pinteresting, WhatsApping. She's got grandchildren around the world who she communicates with, so her phone is in her pillowcase. You know? But we need some boundaries, Granny. We need to step it back a little bit. Because we don't want you on the catiapin, clomazepam, zopiclone, whatever, you know. So we need to find, um, we need to step off planet madness every now and then and find some space in all of this, some equanimity. And um, I don't know, I'm starting to now get out there and talk about it. So I'm on um, a BBC Radio Live, I think, tomorrow, um, talking about this. And um, how, how do we create some balance in all of this when these devices are so seductive, they are, they are wonderful. <coughs> and, and actually, the way in which we use it is we flood our body with legal highs every time you pick up that phone and you check. So you know about dopamine? You know, it's similar in structure to endorphins, um, morphine, oxytocin, the love hormone, cocaine, crystal meth. There's some, yeah, there's some similarity in the structure, but it's kind of addictive. And so every time you go, ooh, what's going on there? Ooh, the, the brain can only take so many oohs scientifically speaking, before we actually start to flip the lid and we go mad. And this is why you've got so many children with ADD, ADHD, and all this, or we go to bed, the brain is fried, okay? So, consciousness in our use of this um, amazing technology that we have. Um, I have a few ideas, I'm playing with them. Um, if anyone has come across Sherry Turkle's work, and her wonderful TED Talk, and her book Alone Together, um, there's a lot of resonance with it in our work, but I think that, you know, we need to, and I heard conveners, and I heard about sacred connection, these, these are good words, 
for us to start using. Um, but I think we need to start looking conscious, bringing more consciousness into how we engage and, and knowing that all the answers aren't in these wonderful devices. They are the slaves, we are the masters. So how do we start to create conscious engagement and bring that into our communication? Because there's a huge part of the brain that in the neocortex, the new cortex, which is about empathy, which is about love, which is about building relationships using human skills, which are all a bit kind of witchcrafty. We still don't really know what they're all about, but we sense it, we feel it, we feel it there, not just up there. So um, conscious engagement. I, I'm recommending not just at, at home, because you cannot separate work and home, can you? And technology means that they're all becoming a little bit merged and all this sort of thing, and there's, that's good as well. But we do need to start thinking about how we, we manage um, ourselves and technology, not just at work, but at home. I, I wonder, sacred spaces at work. I'm working with a management consultancy where they are now starting to have separate spaces where they communicate, they have meetings, but with no technology. Wow. Just for limited spaces of time, small, small amounts of time. Um, at home, do you have sacred spaces where you don't use technology? At the dinner table, when you're watching TV together, speak fast. When we're watching TV together, do you watch one screen? How many screens are being used? What are the messages that we're sending to our children? What is becoming common practice? And I said to my husband, because I do this work, let's now start having conversations with uh, when Maya is around, not to her, but how we're con consciously going to be using our phones and our iPads in front of the TV. OK, I want to watch Doctor Who. So I sometimes think I'll just sit there and do some email, but now I'm pulling back from that because I'm thinking, what is the message that I'm sending to her? She's going to buy it at the moment, maybe in a few years' time she won't. So sacred spaces, and I'll tell you the one big thing, if you want to sleep well at night, don't sleep with your devices. Give yourself half an hour away from them. So sacred spaces, sacred rituals, come to work and rest. Yes, I did say that, come to work and rest. Oscillate every 90 minutes, stop get away from screens, move, and I think you've probably heard stuff like that in other presentations. Go gormless, daydream. Maybe you can have gormless spaces at work, I don't know. Sleep pods, where you go into your own assigned sleep pod and you just kind of go creative and zone out and snooze for five to 10 minutes, who knows, 10 years from now, maybe. But come to work and oscillate Get away from screens, get back on the treadmill, you will be more intelligent. Consolidate the working memory. Give yourself space and time to do that. Get back into nature, get back into the body. So many people arrive at my clinic because they have literally spent too many times, too much time being mental. Uh, not, well, yes, literally, it tips into psychiatric, but we're always up there. Return to the body, stop, put your feet on the ground, put them down, breathe, eat, drink water, look at a picture of someone you love. Hug someone, preferably someone you know, and um, and then continue. Okay, so um, whistle stop tour. Uh, thank you so much for listening, and connect with me if, if you like the two here. Thank you.